Hello. I'm Alejandro Rojas, a Denim Group resident UFO expert, and I have with me James Fox, a UFO filmmaker, and he's made what I often say are the best documentaries in the genre, including Out of the Blue, I Know What I Saw, and his latest just released, The Phenomenon, and uh, it's quite a phenomenon, your your uh, video, your documentary, because you're getting media stories all over the place, aren't you, James? Uh, thank you for having me on, by the way, um, Alejandro. Uh, yes, this is my fourth film on the topic, and the one thing that I've noticed that's quite different from the past, of course, everything changed when the New York Times broke the story on ATIP, that secret Pentagon UFO program, but I'm seeing a, a trend of mainstream media no longer sort of having that incredulous look on their face when they when they cover this topic, which is a breath of fresh air. Mm -hmm. And a part of the reason why it's hard to make fun of the content of your documentary because it's full of government officials, uh, you know, at, at higher levels than we've seen in the past. I guess what's the difference between making the documentary uh, of this sort right now versus, you know, several years ago? Well, two things I'll mention. One is I've learned from my previous mistakes. Um, production value. I mean, my intent was 60 minutes frontline meets UFOs. So very serious reporting because I the stories themselves are so, excuse the pun, out of this world that the only element missing for a tremendously successful film on the topic, in my opinion, is credibility. So if you can create a credible body of work on these incredible accounts and encounters, uh, we've done you've done your job. Mm -hmm. I want to review also. I mean, your your film is sort of uh, taking a look at how the military and the government have dealt with the UFO issue over the years. So you do include um, some of the topics that people may see on other documentaries, but you did it in a way. Um, you included information and interviews that people have never seen before. And I want to go through some of these beginning with project blue book. You have two interviews with guys who were in project blue book, um, Colonel friend and, uh, William Coleman. And what's shocking is I've interviewed both of these guys before too, and they were generally skeptical. However, you cover this incredible UFO encounter, uh, that William Coleman had relayed to you all. Yeah, you know, uh, early on when we were just getting started with the making of this film, it's gone through uh, a number of different titles, one of which was 701. And what 701 was, the it was symbolic of the number of, of cases that were remained unexplained after 12,618 cases were investigated by the Air Force. It didn't mean that we we're going to go through all 12,000 cases are all blue book file cases. It was just that stubborn 10 or 12% of cases that truly defied after rigorous investigation, a terrestrial explanation. The account from, from William Coleman, I found particularly interesting because he's a, a trained observer. He was a pilot in world war II. He was a Colonel in the air force. And in 19, 55, he had this incredibly dramatic, unambiguous, nine minute long encounter with a UFO, a, a disc. Um, and he had three passengers uh, from, they were engineers from Boeing and Lockheed. And hearing their accounts of this dramatic encounter in 1955, and then you juxtapose that with the encounters that were off the West Coast and the East Coast. They ended up on the front page of the New York Times all those years later. The observed technology, um, I think it kind of puts to rest the theory that, oh, this is clearly just something that's, you know, super secret skunk works programs that, that we're observing. That in other words, the, the observed technology is light years advanced of something that we've had 75 years ago and, and even today. Mm -hmm. What I particularly liked about that retelling also is the uh, reenactment that you all did 
which was pretty amazing. It really, it's one thing to hear someone tell an account. It's another thing to kind of feel like you're there. And you went to some pretty uh, extreme lengths to kind of bring that to the audience. Yes. You know, when we were interviewing Colonel William Coleman, um, my DP, this guy, David West, uh, amazing photographer, in, in, we were in Florida. We looked at each other in the middle of the interview, and I looked at him, he looked at me, and I said, this is going to be the opening scene of the movie, and we're going to get a B-25 plane of that era and do a recreation. And we both kind of high-fived each other on the spot. Well, it took five years to make that into a reality. But, uh, but yes, uh, it, it is a wonderful uh a, kind of like a cold open, like a James Bond open in, in the film. It's very exciting um, to hear his account, you know, because most people think of UFO encounters as, oh, I saw this blurry light off in the distance. But when you're talking about hearing testimony from a pilot who thought he was going to collide with this disc-shaped object at treetop level, flying at maximum continuous power, and he explained to me what that meant was if he went any faster – he was worried the engines were going to blow up um, and thought he was going to actually collide with this thing. It's, it's, it's amazing. It's, it's wow. amazing. I think. What was that like? Also, you had sent me some pictures and video of you in the, the plane and you know, this nose cone is like all glass. So it's gotta be quite an experience. Oh so Lee Spiegel found the B two five and he actually he found like a couple of them and uh, I think I called them up and I said, um, yeah, thank you so much for, you know, uh, potentially offering your plane for this recreation that we're doing. Um, I just need to say right out the gate, if you're not able to fly flat out at treetop level, then we're going to have to go somewhere else because that's what it's going to require to create this. And the guy sort of sat there and I just remember I took a moment and he goes, yeah, yeah, we can do that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, once the plane took off, we had cameras everywhere mounted. I, I don't think we could have any on the outside because they were worried about them at the speeds we were traveling, blowing off. But we had them mounted all over the inside. And then I went from the cockpit area, and I had to climb down this, this tube and then into a little narrow tube area, which spat me out in that glass cone with the machine guns at the front. Wow. That's all I can say. <laughs> was very exhilarating. Uh, and and I think it makes a very powerful opening to the movie. Mm -hmm. It really does. And, and it it's a good start because it demonstrated that, you know, this wasn't as black and white as kind of the military has, uh, and especially the Air Force has let us know in the past that, you know, here's some guys who were part of that UFO investigation project blue book that allegedly supposedly justified the, the ending of UFO research for the Air Force. But they're here saying, hey, not only do we think there might be something going on, you know, one of the main guys is saying, I had my own amazing experience. Well, as a side note to that, um, one of the things that William Coleman shared with us on camera was uh, when he was appointed to be public spokesman for Project Blue Book, I think roughly 10 years after his own encounter, he said, Literally, he goes, whoa, hold on a second. You, you might want to reconsider. And they said, well, why is that? He's like, well, I had this very dramatic encounter. You know, and he obviously told the story. And they said, no, no, that's fine. Did you draw any conclusions as to what it was? He said, no. I knew what it wasn't. And so the, one of the first things he did, he said, when he became public spokesman for the Project Blue Book, is he went after his own case. And that case was gone which I found kind of interesting. I don't think that's a coincidence. Look, the better trained observer, the less, you know, ambiguous the encounter. I mean, you're talking about, you know, four people, highly trained observers, three of which were engineers, all scratching their heads, getting within, you know, a stone's throw of hitting this thing right at treetop level, looking at an object with no wings, no tail, no visible means of propulsion, no exhaust vents, they were just baffled by how the hell this thing could possibly be flying. And they all took detailed reports when the plane landed. Project Blue Book was in full effect in 1955. And those reports are just gone. Mm -hmm. Now, there's another incredible incident like this that you were able to cover. Uh, one of the, again, credible uh, former intelligence officials uh, who you have uh, interviewed on the show with some amazing quotes, I think, is 
Chris Mellon, who was a staff director at the uh, Senate uh, Select Committee for Intelligence for 10 years. He also was the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense um, during the Clinton years. And he talks about how Gordon Cooper, the astronaut, had some sightings that Cooper then talked to the president, who talked to William Cohen, who was, or Michael Cohen, who was the uh, the Secretary of Defense for Clinton, who then told Mellon to look into it. And Mellon says he asked a colonel who was upset that he was asking about it in the first place. And the colonel said, oh, we lost all that information. I mean, this this theme of these really incredible encounters and somehow the files are lost. It's, it's a very good point. You know, uh, when I met with Christopher Mellon, that was one thing that we were kind of chuckling about because in the 90s, I, as a civilian, uh, and still am a civilian, <laughs> was uh, interviewing Gordon Cooper about his uh, about this event that happened at, uh, at uh, Edwards Air Force Base circa 1957, uh, a camera crew filming the, I think it was an installation of an F-86 fighter jet uh, landing facility or something of that nature. And then uh, out of the blue, this disc-shaped craft emerges and lands on the dry lake bed and the cameras turn their focus on this thing and I think he said they took a couple of steps toward it while rolling camera and it lifted off and put the gear in the well and shot off at high rate of speed. Um, Cooper had the film footage developed. I asked him, did he watch it? He said, no, I held it up and it was good footage. I could see what it was, a disc on the dry lake bed. And uh, in the in the interim, he was sharing this information with me on camera back in the 90s. And he said that eventually a courier jet came in from Washington, D.C., picked up the film footage, never seen or heard from again. Well, coincidentally, right around that same time in the 90s, Christopher Mellon, former assistant deputy secretary of defense for intelligence, in an official capacity, was going after that evidence. Because apparently Gordon Cooper had come to the White House and discussed it with, with then President uh, uh, Bill Clinton. So we kind of laughed because I was interviewing him about it in the 90s and he was actually officially going after that footage, which uh, apparently just got thrown away. Shocking. And uh, I mean, what do you make of that? Uh, do you believe that it really was thrown away? I think some people, uh, even in government, they're like, well, often, unfortunately, important stuff does get thrown away, especially if they don't know what to do with it. But to, uh, you know, the average person, when you think of the significance of, of stuff like that, you think that's impossible. You know, who would throw away something like that? Well, I brought this very thing up when I had the amazing honor of sitting down with former um, Senator Harry Reid, uh, Senate Majority Leader Harry Reid. Uh, thank you, George Knapp, for that one. And I brought this up, and I wasn't sure how far I was going to push his comfort zone talking about landing UFOs and film footage. But to my absolute amazement, Senator Harry Reid confirmed, in fact, finished the sentence for me when I said I'd interviewed Colonel Gordon Cooper, um, that later to become part of Mercury astronaut Gordon Cooper, about this material that he handed over uh, to a, you know, a courier jet that had come in from Washington. And he literally... Senator Harry Reid goes, oh, and it was never seen or heard from again. I went, yeah, exactly. <laughs> There's stuff like that. You know, did you guys uncover stuff like that? He goes, oh, yeah, yeah. No, it's it's all there. And I thought to myself, excuse me, what? And then I said, wait, Senator, are you saying that there's still some evidence that hasn't seen the light of day? And I, I've told this story a couple of times, but it, it felt like time stopped, you know? It was probably just a brief moment, but it felt like about five minutes when I was waiting for the response. Senator takes a takes a moment. Clearly, he was evaluating whether he was going to reveal what he's about to reveal or not, whether it was worth doing. And he takes a sip of this water and he puts the cat back on and he goes, I'm saying that most of the evidence hasn't seen the light of day. And coming from someone in his position, someone who had launched an official inquiry at the Pentagon into the phenomenon, uh, and I mean, a Senate majority leader, he was the yeah. most important Senator literally for many yeah. years. Yeah. No, very powerful Senator. And, um, that was a bold statement. Uh, very, it was a moment. And it felt like to me, it feels like he really wants this message out there. He really wants people to understand, 
um, these things, that there is a lot of information out there that has not seen the light of day yet? Well, I mean, there's lots of people that have hinted at it that were part of the ATIP program as well. Lou Elizondo, Christopher Mellon, indirectly, um, has in hinted to that as well, that there's a lot of stuff that it hasn't seen. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, you're not going to throw away film footage of a landed flying saucer. I'm sorry, but no one's going to do that. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, that's that's what is, is hard to swallow, that something like that's going to get thrown away, which is interesting because, of course, what's happened in the interim lately is that the Senate um, Intelligence Committee that Chris Mellon worked for is now asking the government, hey, you guys are saying that you're taking this seriously since the Navy has revealed that. We want to know more about it. We want you on Chris Mellon's suggestion. He suggested this in the Washington Post. We want you to get all this information together, give us a briefing on it, and also make the public aware of what you've uh, done in this field. Uh, who knows what we're going to get? I'm sure we're not going to get the Gordon Cooper film. Well, it's, it's interesting what's happening, and I think it's much more difficult for the government to pull the wool over, our, uh, uh, over the eyes of an educated population on it. Do you know what I mean? In other words, the more credible information, the more credible people coming mm -hmm. forward, disclosing what, you know, what, what's known, um, it's more difficult for them to sort of you know, write it off as swamp gas and air, weather balloons. Mm hmm. Another official that you talked to was uh, John Podesta, our former. Uh, he worked for Bill Clinton. Uh, he's he's been in the White House for a long time. Uh, he was part of Obama's transition uh, group and, of course, was Hillary Clinton's campaign manager. Uh, he's kind of been the central location uh, when it comes to, you know, being the UFO expert in the White House, at least during the Clinton uh, administration. Um. You know, what was the sense that you got from from John Podesta about what's going on right now? It's not like we've heard a lot. He will tweet about things going on right now. Um, and he certainly tweeted his excitement in the Senate taking uh, notice. But, uh, yeah, what kind of what did, feeling did you get from him? That there were official inquiries made during the Clinton administration, uh, part of the Rockefeller Initiative, going after Roswell. And he basically said, look, we were not happy with the answers we were getting. And uh, Clinton took it a lot more seriously, apparently, than Obama. According to him, President Obama was like, oh, isn't that cute? You've got your little pet project on UFOs. But Obama didn't have much interest, he told me. But then he said that um, he really wants to see, he knows there's a lot more going on than what we're told. And he wants to see government transparency on the topic. I want to tell people we've got a lot of people here in the chat. Thanks for joining us. Uh, if you are in, you know, watching us on on YouTube or Facebook, do let us know if you have questions. Perhaps to preface it with a Q or the word question so I can tell because there's a lot of conversation going on. Um, there's somebody here named uh, John Doe who's a little skeptical of what's going on. But at this point, it's really difficult, I think, for anybody to be skeptical. And, and my sense is that the media isn't so skeptical. What's unfortunate is that the media isn't so much doing what you're doing, what you did with this documentary, and digging deeper and interviewing these people about the nuances of this. I mean, if the Senate is taking this seriously and starting to ask questions, a lot of your what's in your documentary should be the type of things that they're looking for. Well, you know, it's a potentially a huge story. And I, I'd like to say to the people out there that are skeptical, I, I'm not screaming from the hilltops, ET is here. Um, I'm also not trying to prophesize around the world to get people to join my cult of believers. B believe me, that's not what this is about. This is, there's overwhelming evidence that there are structured craft of unknown origin exhibiting flight characteristics that are defy physics as we understand it. This is not just me saying this. This is trained fighter pilots and high level government and military officials going on the record. All we'd like to know is more government transparency and let's not be afraid to say we don't know what's going on, but we're willing to study it. Right. And that's what's interesting about what may be coming uh, is 
you know, even though the Senate's looking at what the uh, military is doing, what the intelligence agencies are doing, they very well could say, okay, great for these reports. It looks like you have everything well under control. Keep on keeping on. And, and most of this information stays classified. Uh, do you feel that would be justified or, um, you know, what should they do regarding trying to share information with the public? One of the things that I've had to come to terms with is when I started investigating this 26 years ago, I thought it was going to be a quick, oh, okay, so elected representatives and the president are all in on this big cover up and, you know, UFOs are real and that's that. But it's far more complex, I'm discovering. In fact, I feel like I, I almost know less today than I did 26 years ago. Um, what I do know is that it seems like the more solid, tangible, physical evidence has escaped oversight from our elected officials. Um, it might be in the hands of uh, the private sector, some of it or most of it, um, that the intelligence agencies seem to have escaped oversight. I know that Senator Harry Reid said the level of opposition and resistance he got from the intelligence agencies back in 2007 when he was launching this investigation, the super secret UFO Pentagon program, um, he said it was, you know, a miracle. He got it. He actually got it going because of the level of resistance he'd gotten from it. Right. He even said the guy he put in charge of it, everybody wanted him fired and he had yeah. a hard time just keeping the guy's job. Yeah. So what it tells me is that a couple of things, one, and I'm sorry if I'm speaking slowly here, but I need to carefully craft how I'm going to say this. What it reveals that elected officials don't necessarily have access to this information Two, that if it were revealed what they knew, then it would also reveal their vulnerabilities on, and what they didn't know. In other words, if there was, you know, people use the word disclosure. I'm not a huge fan of that word, but if let's just say if they were to disclose what they did know, um, it would expose so much of things that they don't know. Um, it, it, it was explained to me by those in a position to know, James, they said, don't look at it, the secrecy, so much of a question of what the government knows. Look at the secrecy as a question of what the government doesn't know. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. Um, here's a question. What metal scenes got cut from the movie? And I'm guessing they're referring to the part with uh, scientist Gary Nolan and Jacques Vallée uh, presenting, um, you know, their research on potentially anomalous metals. Well, uh, Jacques and, and Gary Nolan are very cautious with what they're comfortable saying prior to proper uh writing up their, some of their conclusions in a scientific journal and getting peer reviewed. So for them, it was more of a question of, Hey, this is what we're doing. Preliminary results are astonishing. Uh, we don't understand what we're looking at, but um, we are going to look at it further and get peer review. And then uh, once we're ready to make any definitive announcements that that will come. And, and we, uh, we had to we had to tone some of that down, I think, because of Jacques' concerns and because of Gary Nolan's association with with uh, Stanford. Mm -hmm. So, but I mean, they are committed to releasing information when they can. Absolutely, that's why they're doing it. Yeah, in fact, they they intend to do stuff with it. You know, but but again, they're, these guys are true scientists. You know, they're trying to replicate their stuff in a lab and get it peer reviewed and written up in scientific journals and all the right steps that scientists take before they can draw any conclusions. Right. Mm -hmm. so. And here's a question about that. The signal who uh, is a great open minds follower. Hello again. But he says, James, thanks for your work. We owe you so many drinks. So next time you run into signal, he'll get you, get you loaded. But like can you remember how long ago you filmed those scenes in the lab 
with Nolan and Valet? And do you have any idea when they may be ready to share? Thank you for that question. And uh, I, I will take you up on a couple of tequila shots when the time is right. We can rub shoulders again in uh, crowded bars with strangers. Looking forward uh, to that. That'll Look, be the day. Looking forward to that. Um, so we shot that scene in 2019, early 2019. And um, he, coronavirus has slowed down that research because Gary has, has uh, from from direction of the White House has been doing studies on the coronavirus in, in, in a lab. So that's taking up a lot of his time right now. So I think that what Gary and, and Jacques are doing, unfortunately got kind of delayed because of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. And I guess we should uh, describe a little bit who these guys are. Uh, Jacques Vallée was kind of the protege of Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who, of course, the History Channel had a show all about him that I wrote many articles on for Den of Geek called uh, Project Blue Book. He was a real astronomer who was a consultant for uh, the Air Force during all of their UFO research. And then Dr. Gary Nolan is a very well-respected scientist out of Stanford, working on DNA, and he's kind of gotten to that point where he's so renowned, where he does not feel, he feels comfortable doing research into some of this anomalous type of, of, of things, and uh, which is wonderful, um, because it's rare that scientists really kind of want to stick their neck out to let people know that they have an interest or want to do some work in these arenas. Yeah, you know, Gary's got everything to lose and nothing to gain. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a question. I'm not sure I completely understand it. Uh, that's He says, uh, Crew, Cru Crew Cut Chronicles says, I'd like to ask James what he didn't talk, why you didn't talk about the five continents meeting, Russia-Chinese involvement in the documentary. Well, we did address Russia, but we did it through uh, George Knapp. And I did mm -hmm. actually go to China uh, a couple of times uh, uh, with Don Schmidt. Uh, we met over there, actually. And um, I don't, I'm not sure what you mean about the five continent meetings, but, you know, there's only so much you can cram. I mean, I went to South America and I did the Virginia case, which is the equivalent of the uh, Roswell of Brazil, uh, three or four times. Uh, I just couldn't get it all in. Let's put it that way. I, I need like a 10 part mini series, which right. I might, which I might end up doing, but it's too early to talk about right now because I'm still suffering from PTSD from the making of this one. Well, we hope you get it. That would be awesome. Well, it, it, um, it'll, happen. it'll happen. Don't worry. Yeah, it'll happen. It's just, I need a little time to recover. Here's a question by Lawrence Johnson. He says, what's your biggest takeaway from the production of uh, your great film? For me? Yeah. I've never seen the level of public endorsement from mainstream characters like we're seeing now. Um, that's something that I've walked away from. And I've also never delved into the potential intelligence behind the phenomenon. That's something that I... I've done for the first time. If you've noticed my previous works, 50 Years of Denial, uh, Out of the Blue, version one and two, um, I know what I saw. We deal with close encounters of the first and second kind, not the third kind. And so this is the first time I've delved into that arena. And um, I did it cautiously. I was concerned about losing uh, some of the higher profile individuals that have participated in this production. Um, thank God we pulled that off. But again, what I walked away from this film is is uh, people seem ready to um, uh, for for more transparency on this topic and to publicly endorse a film on UFOs, which quite honestly I, I've never really seen that before, as much as I'm seeing it now. It's very encouraging. You know and you make a really great point um, in that most of your film and most of your films are typically like this. These are officials, credibilities, you know, uh, paramount, obviously, for your films. And uh, this film chronicled kind of the government involvement with a lot of officials in it. But it ended with this 
encounter, the Ruwa encounter, which those of us who know about it, you know, uh, scratch our heads about what might have happened there because it was in Zimbabwe in the 90s. All of these children see a craft land and this uh, entity come out and they describe it. Um, it is a very credible, but you ended the film with that. I guess, what message were you sending with the ending, uh, the film with that case? And um, how did, because from what I understand, well, I'll ask the second question next. I don't want to stack them. In. Well, first of all, I'd like to say to your audience that I don't expect anyone to believe what I'm about to tell you. I, I really don't. because No, because I, I myself didn't believe it either. In fact, when I heard about it in the 90s, through Steven Spielberg, through a mutual friend, this woman, Janet Yang, uh, she's like, oh, well, just so you know, uh, Steven Spielberg declined an interview with you, uh, which you know I was naive enough to think I could pull off at the time. Uh, <laughs> but, he, but he does want you to know that uh, you should look into this landing case at a school in, uh, in Africa. I think, I don't even know if he said Rua, but Africa. And I thought to myself, come on. I was like, there's no way a landing, an alleged landing, at a school in broad daylight with potentially 100 witnesses could occur and the whole world not know about it. And so I wrote it off right then and there. So I'm asking your audience to suspend judgment and to just listen to the testimony because it took me 10 years to even look into this case. but. I think this is one of the most, in fact, I don't think, I know this is the most compelling close encounter of the third kind in modern history. And the reason I say that is the sheer volume of eyewitness testimony. The Harvard psychiatrist, John Mack, flying to location right after the incident occurred, documenting 66 children on camera all saying the same thing tracking down the teachers going to africa to the landing site meeting with more witnesses finding the witnesses today bringing them together for the first time in 20 years thanks for randall nickerson who's got a film coming out about that specific incident aerial phenomenon i think it's called um it's truly unbelievable it's it's I don't care if you're interested in UFOs or not. You have to see this case. And um, and I think you'll agree. In fact, there hasn't been one person, not one person, no matter how skeptical they've been, look at the testimony of the children then and now. We don't just interview them as children. We find them, track them down, and, and meet with them as adults. And they're all over the world. And they're saying the same thing today as they were 20 years ago, 24 years ago. It's amazing. It is an extraordinary case, and um, getting kind of back to what you mentioned before, all of these high-level officials, such as Chris Mellon, um, you know, uh, Harry Reid, and some others, I think you've told me this before, wanted to see the film before you launched it to make sure there was no, you know, you weren't putting in something weird that they didn't want to be associated with it. And they all signed off on the film, even with that uh, Ruwa uh, case kind of uh, ending the film. I was honestly, excuse me, I was terrified for several years because think about it. You've got people the likes of, you know, former Senate Majority Harry Reid, okay? He is now and forever connected to a film that reports on an alleged contact case in Africa where the occupants reportedly exit the craft and interact telepathically, some cases at arm's length, with nearly 100 kids in a playground in broad daylight. Now think about that for a minute. The average person is gonna say, what have you been smoking? I, and I get it, but I know I get it. I believe me, I get it. I don't expect- Me too. Anyone, I don't expect anyone to believe anything I'm saying but watch the testimony of these children, both then and now, and I can assure you, uh, your opinion will change. Mm -hmm. I'm also uh, you know, skeptical of, the, of these entity encounters, and there's only a handful 
where I'm really like, wow, there's really something there. And Rua is definitely one of those cases. So people got to watch that. And I think it says a lot. Um, this is a good follow-up question to that. And earlier I had said John Doe was skeptical and it, it turns out I was misinterpreting uh, something he had uh, said. So he's not skeptical. And in fact, here he is. He says, what's the most chilling thing you've learned or yeah, you've learned to do with the phenomena? What keeps you up at night about the phenomenon? There are some things that I learned during the production of the film that were off the record. It was like I'd meet with these witnesses, I'd meet with people from the Navy, I'd meet with people from ATIP, and they would share off the record a couple of things. And I think to myself, I had the same reaction to that as I did when I first heard the Rua case. Like, you've got to be kidding me, that can't be so, you know? So um, things that are going in and out of the water, things of that nature. But again, I. You know, these were kind of off the record. I mean, if more evidence comes out, I'll feature that in, in upcoming projects. But uh, those, I did, I did hear some pretty, pretty crazy stuff from very credible Let's, people. Um, here's another one. I'm trying to. I'll get back to some of those who are asking second questions. I want to make sure everybody gets one in. But Jonathan Davies, or did we ask one from him? He says, anyway, does Jane believe the meta material or the meta metal papers will end up being the smoking gun that blows the roof off of this topic? I don't know. I'm holding out, I mean, maybe for the scientific community that might uh, raise an eyebrow, uh, but I'm holding out for the further release of, of uh, footage, uh, official Official footage. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at. Because if you've got extremely unambiguous, broad daylight, up close, official footage from the Navy and the Air Force, and then you have the eyewitness, coupled with eyewitness testimony and radar confirmation, that's pretty solid. Mm -hmm. And we've heard, at least I know from Harry Reid, uh, from Lou Elizondo, who ran ATIP, the Pentagon program, uh, mm -hmm. at saying that there is more footage out there. Oh yeah. Um, look, one of the things that we did in this film, um, we put a call to action at the end. Uh, that was the idea of, of this guy, Dan Farah's uh, fellow producer uh, who, who uh, produced ready player one with Spielberg. And we've been really lucky to have him on the team. He's been, he's been an amazing asset. And he said to me, you know, James, you should really put a call to action at the end. Because, you know, people want to be able to take, they want to be able to do something. So we say, look, you know, contact your representative and ask for government transparency. They need to know. They need to hear from their constituents. Um, it's important. Um, I'd like to mention one other thing, if I may. Uh, having learned from my previous films, uh, David Marler, his archive in, in Albuquerque, New Mexico was invaluable. Putting together the pieces of the puzzle historically, uh, not just writing about it, but, but, but seeing it and seeing the headlines and hearing the audio files, absolutely priceless. Uh, David West, who's a National Geographic photographer, beautifully shot this film. Um, and then we had people like Mark Barish, who's an outstanding mainstream writer, um, helping stitch these stories together with a very powerful narrative. It really took a village, you know. It, it, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm in awe of of all the talent that were involved in putting this film together. And our buddy Lee Spiegel. Of oh, don't, of of course, Lee Spiegel. Yeah, <laughs> Lee Spiegel. You know, he found that B two five bomber. <laughs> and I mean, look, if I was going to sit here and plug everybody that was, yeah, you know, yeah, happen, we'd be here all day. But um, but Lee Spiegel, and you need to know that you know, you, one person can't do it all. You need to have, you need to surround yourself with people that are better at, uh, you know, doing things than you, you know what I mean? Like I can mm -hmm. do, shooting, I can do editing, I can do all that, the interviews, but you know, you need to bring in the talent. You need to recognize that there are people a lot better at, at what, you know, you'd like to do than, than you and, and uh, bring those people on and, and do what's best for the film. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, 
Uh, I've got, just so people know, we've did one of these live interviews for Den of Geek with uh, David Marler. Definitely check that out. He's a great researcher. I've also got an interview or an article on Den of Geek about how uh, unidentified help get the Senate to ask for these UAP questions. And just to kind of uh, put a point on what you were saying earlier is right now is a very unique point in time where the Senate is actually considering this, that the Senate is asking for these reports. And once they get these reports, the Intelligence Committee, uh, of which Kamala Harris is a part of, um, and Rubio is out there, you know, and and Warner, the Democrat, the, the lead Democrat in the, in the committee, are both talking about how they take this seriously and they are really looking forward to this information right now is the most important time to let them know what you think and if you have an interest in this topic yeah and look we're not saying that and i know i've sound like a broken record but we're not saying that you know et is here in fact if you'll notice in the film we did our darndest not to try to speculate or conjecture as to where who these things you know, where they're from and who they are and why they're here. We have no idea. We don't claim to know. All we're saying is that we need to look at this seriously. We need further government transparency. And uh, we should embrace figuring out what it is. We should all work together. And I think ultimately, I think it's I think it's going to have a unifying effect on us. I mean, this is one of those few topics that transcends politics and religion and borders and, and um, really brings us together. And mm -hmm. who knows what the unifying effect of this reality could eventually have on humanity. I think it'll be great. I think we'll eventually look at ourselves for who we really are. One, one race on one planet. I, you know, I hate to sound like a, you know, a <laughs> tree hugging hippie here, but I really believe that. I love your message, buddy. Um, Hamid Osman, he uh, kind of touches on what you were just saying, actually. He says, hey, Gems, absolutely loved your film. Have a question. What's your personal opinion on what the phenomenon actually is? Is it extraterrestrials? Great question. Hi, by the way. Um, I guess the best thing I could say that I could say comfortably is that it appears we're dealing with an omnipresent intelligence that has the ability to manifest itself in a multitude of ways. Uh, it's nuts and bolts. It also appears to be psychic. Um, and it could be, I have to emphasize could, because I just don't know, but it could be something maybe interdimensional or a parallel universe. Could be. A lot that's, of scientists actually uh, kind of are warming up to that idea as they warm up to the idea that we may have something coming here. Um, here's a question from Special Access Podcast. Cute little play on the SAP acronym. Anyway, he says, have the MSM reached out to Harry Reid's office to confirm his light of day quote? Of course, you have Harry Reid on film saying this himself, so it, he definitely said it. But uh, it's a good point. Has anybody uh, from the mainstream media followed up with Harry Reid on that? Oh, they had to. Are you kidding? Every single, the, every single major news outlet said, before we run this, we need confirmation from Senator Reid's office. And Senator Reid has made himself completely available for confirmation. He's written emails about it. He has his assistant uh, respond immediately to any inquiries. and, and um, yeah, he's been amazing. And in fact, I just sent him a thank you note a couple of days ago, which he's probably getting the mail today or tomorrow. But uh, he's he said, I stand behind everything I've said in that film. It's all correct. Uh, Michael Boyle is asking, how sincere do you think the interests of Senators Rubio and Warner are on this topic? Um, sorry, let me stop my phone from ringing there. Um, no I would say... When you there's a there's footage of Warner, I think his name is Senator Warner, right after he walks out of, of a debriefing. I don't know if you've seen this or not of of the phenomenon, and he's got this like look on his face, like I don't know what they just told him, but boy, he seemed like whoa, we need to look into this, you know. 
And Rubio seems very sincere when they say, look, you know, like Chris, Christopher Mellon pointed out something I thought was a really good point. He's like, if these had, these objects had a flag from like Russia or China or some other foreign power, it would literally be all hands on deck to get to the bottom of this. You know, um, I think that there's enough tangible evidence coupled with radar confirmation and video confirmation and people like David Fravor testifying on the Hill to these people that they know something truly unusual is going on. And I think they're sincerely wanting to look into it further. I, I could say that and, and, and everything would indicate that's the case. So I agree. I, I mean, if you Google those videos of their interviews, they could have easily backed down and kind of poo-pooed it or, or talked it down, but they're not. They're they're saying, you know, they're taking it very seriously, and they seem sincere on that. So, yeah, what did they see? That's what's interesting. Uh, the Zignal has another question. This is a great one because I know there was, an, you know, uh, as usual with it, especially your film, though, what we see in the movie is the tip of the ice, iceberg regarding what you actually filmed. And there was a lot of stuff, unfortunately, you couldn't get in there that you shot. And uh, the signal's asking, what was your favorite darling you had to cut from the film? So All many. right, well, there were two scenes, two scenes in particular. One was I went to Virginia, Brazil, uh, at least, I think I went four times, chased down eyewitness testimony of the Roswell of Brazil, the 1996 Virginia case. And that case is so compelling. I mean, it's, it's so amazing and it's beautifully shot. I spent probably six or seven months editing a beautiful little sequence together and there was no room for it in the film. And I mm. cut every second of that out. You can imagine how much effort went into that. I mean, my God, I was knocking on doors, chasing down leads all over, uh, you know, Brazil. And um, that was very painful. Another, some of the researchers uh, that I had, I was going to have Kevin Randall, Don Schmidt, um, Stanton Friedman. Uh, uh, there were interviews in Australia with Australian researchers that were amazing. And I just simply didn't have a room. I, I, I At one point, I remember I hit the delete button. I had to close my eyes. And it was like a gut punch. It was like, you know, oh, I just can't believe I deleted six months of editing. Oh, God. And uh, it was tough. But I had to do what I felt was best for the movie. You know, and, and look, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to include this in other productions. It just, meant, just means that there just wasn't space for it. I mean, look, I'm really happy with the end result, the phenomenon. I think it does its job. And I don't think I'll ever do history again. I think we've done that. Now, I think we can stick our teeth into the cases and assume that the people viewing it are going to have uh, enough of a background because of that history that we've done in the past. So um, now I can have the, this is kind of the fun part, right? I can really look into the cases, look into the metal stuff that's happening and um, really start to explore the overall meaning, which I'm really excited to do. Uh, Lawrence Johnson has another question. He says, do you guys really believe that humanity is really truly ready for the impact of the reality uh, that the film suggests? What about the Rand report? Uh, I've heard of the Rand report, but I don't recall. But, but I will say this. A lot of people already know it's happening. A lot. I mean, I've talked to people all around the world that have had face-to-face -face contact. I've talked to the generals, I've talked to the military guys, I've talked to the, uh, you know, elected officials. I've talked to so, so many witnesses that have had contact. Um, they're fine. They're operating fine. The reality hasn't, I mean, it's given them, a, they said they never look at the universe in the same way and where we fit in our place in it, but it hasn't like, people aren't jumping out of windows, you know? I. Yeah, I think we need it, quite honestly. I think that now more than ever, I think it will bring this world together. I really do. You know, um, I kind of, in answering the question, or at least my feelings along this is that it it is needed, but in the right way. 
And that's what's great about your film and all of these people coming out is we're finally making headway to do that in the right way. In other words, that, you know, all of this information has to be vetted for its credibility and, and um, that the facts need to be substantiated. And your film, for instance, is doing that in, in a major way and bringing all of that together. And I think we slowly move that way together and, and we're headed towards it. And I think once people get that information, yeah, they'll be comfortable. They'll, they'll have a better understanding of um, um, what's going on. Um, here's a question uh, from The Signal. One of my favorite new things from the film was the head teacher of the school bluntly admitting that they were visited that day. Did she tell you more off camera? Okay, is this is uh, Judy Bates in, in Rua, Zimbabwe? Is that he's referring to? I'm. Uh, that's what I'm guessing he's referring to. Yes, she had full confirmation of what the kids saw. Wow. So, so there was one adult. Um, well, let's look, see. Well, yeah, but look, there were. If you look at the at the news coverage that we do prior to getting into the students, the object was seen over several days in and around the area: Harare, Rua, South Africa. Um, and then it chose the school to land and make contact. Mm -hmm. Someone mentioned my coffee cup. It's got to be, I'm, it's a sippy cup because I spill my coffee too often. I had to get a big bottom sippy cup so I don't I'll trash the place. I'm having a little of this sparkling water here. So I don't get in trouble. Lunar Light is asking, did everyone, uh, and this is, seems to be also about Ruwa, did everyone have the same description of what the face uh to face contact looked like, uh, what did they say it looked like? Um, well, some of them got closer to the creature than others, obviously. Uh, coincidentally, some of the witnesses that we brought together 20 years later just happened to be standing next to each other during the encounter. And we discovered that at the time when, when we brought the, 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 uh, the children, now adults, back, back together. Um, and yeah, I mean, they, look, they all talk about these small beans, big heads and these big almond eyes. And that's, they just couldn't stop talking about the eyes. Like when you looked into these big black almond shaped eyes, it was almost like mesmerizing. Time froze. Um, and they were just, you know, uh, almost in a trance. And that's how they I communicated. Here's a question, uh, Jonathan Davies again. He says, those New York Times journalists that asked you to cut out scenes because they posed a problem, which scenes were those? Are they related to the Wilson document? The Wilson document is uh, an alleged document where some uh, admiral who denies this uh, allegedly had told someone that there were some kind of crash programs going on. But uh, this is something I'm not aware of you saying that uh, some journalists no. asked you to cut. No, no, I, I did actually, I did get someone say to me, do you really have to keep that in? <laughs> that was Christopher Mellon saying that the New York Times sort of, you know, got it wrong. They should have put more emphasis on the fact that UFOs are real as opposed to this secret, super secret, you know, Pentagon program. Um, I will say this. The New York Times did more due diligence on that story Anyone who actually has written for the Times will tell you they won't just print stuff without quadruple checking every aspect of it, the story. They wanted the documentation from ATIP. They wanted to find out about Lou Elizondo. They wanted to find out about from directly from Harry Reid about the program. They wanted internal documents. I mean, that was a rigorous, rigorous process, according to the people that I talk with. And so um, what went to print was probably a fraction of what the story could have been. But again, the New York Times needed to do their due diligence before they were going to just publish stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm writing an article right now on Open Minds at TV kind of about how that all came about and how Chris Mellon and Lou Elizondo made all this happen, um, which includes a lot of quotes from your documentary. Oh, but, really? um, oh yeah. And I'm literally <clears throat> going to post that in the next hour. But to your point, that original New York Times article that revealed the, the Pentagon program, the DOD denied a lot of what was in it. Uh, however, 
the vast, 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 if 99%, if not all of what was in that original article has stood the test of time. And it was a DOD who has been proven to be wrong um, over the years, which is really interesting. But just to support what you were saying, they really did a, an incredible job really uh, vetting all of that information. Yeah. I mean, all right. Big story. You kind of have to, right? Mm-hmm. So that's really interesting. So let's see if I can find a one another one. New York Times journalists. Um, well, I'll ask you this, because really we should probably start to wrap up anyway. Uh, how is the film doing? Uh, it's been climbing in the charts. I got a text message from the distributor yesterday, and he said he's never seen anything like it because it's it usually you know peaks the first week and then kind of drops off, but it's it, it's actually climbing. Um, it's number one for documentaries worldwide on iTunes, and it's number three now as of this morning uh, worldwide on all films. So very encouraging um, that it's it's getting such a uh, a warm reception and uh, and such a positive reaction from the general public all over. So I have to remind your audience that this is not just a quick flash in the pan. This is going to be something that we're going to be pushing uh, for the next year or so if not longer, and we're going to continue uh, getting the word out, getting the film out on a multitude of platforms and 40-plus languages uh, in all the countries. Um, we're even considering discussions on a theatrical once the COVID uh, subsides um, around the world. So this is going to be a marathon run, not just a quick flash in the pan. Mm hmm. And so people know, I mean, it's streaming in a lot of places. We have the link below in the description, whether you're watching on YouTube or Facebook to go to the Phenomena website where you can see where it's streaming. However, if you get it on iTunes and Vimeo, you also get a lot of bonus content. Uh, maybe you could tell people a little bit about that bonus content. Yeah, well, I put uh, I did a story. I did a wonderful sit down interview with Story Musgrave. He was a uh, NASA astronaut, sh uh, piloted the space shuttle. Oh my gosh, uh, he had these really intense eyes. He's really, I mean, talk about a driven person. I'm like, well, what are you doing when you're not when you're not flying the space shuttle? He's like, oh, I was doing uh, uh, surgery. I'm a surgeon. <laughs> I'm like, oh, great, right? You've got more degrees than a thermometer, you know. But anyway, he talks about these incredibly times out in space and going around the planet and all these different epiphanies. And oh my God, he's a Fantastic speaker. I, I think I put like 35, 40 minutes of him talking. I got outtakes from Dr. Hynek. I got stuff from the the National Press Club event I did with, with Leslie Kane, all unedited, raw presentations at the, at, the, uh, at the podium there. A whole bunch of like three hours of great bonus material for the same price. So if you are going to buy it, download, make sure you get it from iTunes or Vimeo because those are the only two platforms that offer the bonus material for the same price. Mm hmm. And uh, some people are asking with all of that extra footage, what do you plan to do with that? Mini series. Awesome. And how do we how do we help you get that mini series to happen? Just write a check for 10 million bucks and send it to my P.O. box. OK, so and we'll list the P.O. box or if you go to the website, get the content and uh, ask them where to send the 10 million dollars. Um, yeah, as soon as I get $10 million, I'm definitely going to send it your way. But uh, I do want to talk about one other thing. You know, we mentioned our good buddy Lee Spiegel. And uh, one of the exciting things that you all were able to retrieve, uh, which was something I know that Lee and I have worked at, the only footage I had, we had some at Open Minds, uh, a little bit of footage from this UN event that happened in the 70s where uh, Lee Spiegel organized for the country of Granada. Uh, this UFO presentation for the United Nations, and he worked closely with Dr. J. Allen Hynek and with Jacques Vallée and others. And uh, this was a whole symposium that went on for for quite some time. And uh, I know the film had a little bit of footage of that, amongst a lot of amazing archival footage that you were able to retrieve. Um, but you guys were able to find, I guess, all of the footage. I think it's I. I I want to say it's over an hour long. It might be two hours. I'm not entirely sure. I'd have to look. We got it all. It took a year once we found it to actually get our hands on it. But yeah, I remember calling. I think I called him. Did he say I remember sent him an email? I think I called him 
I, I think I, I remember saying, are you sitting down? Or what have you been, what is it that you've been looking for for over 40 years? You know, because I could, my sister Kelly Fox spent a couple of years going after archival footage and she uncovered some real gems, never before seen stuff. We took some big risks. We had to contact the heads of CBS because there were all kinds of rights issues. Oh my Lord, I could write a book on it. But yeah, as a result, we have never before seen archival interviews featured in this film that I don't care how much you think you know about UFOs that you have not seen. I know that because Richard Dolan has admitted it. Jacques Vallée has admitted it. Lee Spiegel even had said, I did that event and I've never seen footage from that. So there's a lot of wonderful archive material for, for, for those to enjoy. There's a ton of material practically nobody's ever seen. So, yeah, nobody can say that your film doesn't have a, an abundance of stuff that hasn't been seen before. So we'll wrap it up here. Of course, like I said before, we've got the link so you can watch James's film below. Uh, check it out. It's an incredible documentary. All of the people in the chat who have seen it are raving about it. They loved it also. So job well done once again, James. And thank you so much for joining us here on Den of Geek. Thanks. All right. And thank you all for joining us in the chat. Be sure to uh, subscribe to the Facebook if you're there or to our YouTube page uh, because we have these uh, live streams occasionally. And it's always a lot of fun and lots of great people like James to talk to. So thank you all for being here. And James, thank you so much for, for taking the time. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it.